Hi, this is Misha, and of course, cats. Say hi, Earl. Now say bye, Earl. Okay. As a lot of you know, I have a, a big interest in Japanese guns, and uh, have done for a long time. And one that you don't hear a lot about is the Japanese Type 26 or 10 2 or 10 or 2, sorry, 2 10 6 year type, which was Japan's first domestically designed and uh, manufactured revolver. Even though this was adopted in the late 19th century, it soldiered on right into the end of World War II in 1945, so it had over a 50 year service. In the past, I haven't had many to show you, but today I have three, so I thought I would do so. Here, we actually have a late production gun in original condition with original grips and original kind of fire blued hammer. Here we have an early production gun, or at least relatively early, that was refurbished with the refurbished blue and the replacement serrated grips. And then here we have a just typical example. Most of these guns are not in amazing condition. This one is mechanically solid and not really rusty, just honest bluing wear with original grips. And this is a mid-late production gun. So what do we have here? Well, after the Meiji Restoration, Japan rapidly modernized, and that included its military. This led to the Murata series of infantry rifles and carbines. And after they had that down, they turned their attention to handguns. Now previously, they had been using Smith & Wesson No. 3s in 44 Russian caliber. Those were a top break revolver. They took a great deal of inspiration from those, but also other guns such as the Austrian Rostgasser. And in 1893, they tested this critter here and adopted it as the 26 type, which was the 26th year of the reign of the Meiji Emperor. Now, in reality, it did not go into production and did not go into service until 1894, the 27th year, but it was selected in year 26, so that's its name. A very similar thing happened with the Type 14 pistol later on, but I digress. What do we have? It's a pretty typical gun for its day and age. It's about eight and a half inches tip to tip. It's got a 4.7 inch barrel, which actually is a length that would continue through all of the Nambu pistols like the Papa Nambu and the 14. It weighs just a hair over one kilogram, so 2.2 to five pounds. It is a double action only spurless hammer, although the Japanese called this hammerless. It has a hammer, as you see, it's just there's no spur and there's no way to cock it back. It's a fixed firing pin, kind of a bird's beak nipple on the end. It's a top break, They're very much inspired by the Smith & Wesson. A lot of people equate this to a Webley, but a Webley has a lever on the side. This is more like, you know, with the lever on the top. So it kind of reminds me more of a Smith & Wesson, but that's just me. It holds six cartridges, nine millimeter Japanese revolver, nine by 22 rimmed, this was a reasonably average cartridge for the late 19th century, although most considered it anemic today. You have to remember, this was still during the era of black powder, 
right when smokeless was coming onto the scene. We started to see quite a few smokeless powder hand, uh, rifles by the 1890s, but most handguns, which were at the time were revolvers, were still black powder. Just going to a small diameter bullet, such as 9mm, was a considerable advancement, really. It really clocks in somewhere around 38 Smith & Wesson. Definitely less than 38 Special. Some people say less than 38 Smith & Wesson. I talked with Terry, who runs a very great Japanese website, and she fired original ammunition and chronographed it. And while the results are pretty widely varied, it seems like it's you know, kind of hanging in there with about 38 Smith & Wesson. So a reasonably good rifle cartridge. I mean, excuse me, a handgun cartridge, but nothing special. At least it did have light recoil, though. So those are the specs. It's a revolver. It does revolver things. Early guns, original guns, would have kind of a uh, charcoal-type blue. It has this iridescent fire-blued hammer. And as I said, original grips would be checkered, finely checkered wood. Early grips would be made out of beech wood. Later grips would be made out of mahogany. Oh, and it has the ever important lanyard ring. These are going to production in 1894, as I said and first would be issued to cavalry troops and non-commissioned officers. The Japanese army kind of had the British way of doing things where actual officers were expected to private purchase their sidearms so officers could purchase this gun as well as others that were approved for military use. It was basically the Japanese version of a PX. These would be produced at the Tokyo Artillery Arsenal and in 1900, the black powder in the cartridge would be switched to smokeless. This would continue to be produced through World War I, although by that time, the Nambu Army pistol, what we know as the Papa Nambu, was coming into service, but those are never made in large numbers. This was the standard gun, really until it was officially replaced in the late 20s by the Type 14. In reality, it wasn't until the 1930s. Main production would end at the Tokyo Arsenal, Koisuka, in 1923 because of the Great Kanto Earthquake, which halted a lot of production there. However, around 1928, some guns were put together from parts. There was kind of a final run of about four or 500, maybe made then, assembled from parts. And then older guns were refurbished, such as this one here from 28 to about 1935, maybe a little later. If the original grips were in good shape, they would keep them. If they weren't, they would replace them with these simplified and also more robust, they're a little thicker, a little more rounded grips. They would also go from the kind of early high grade blue to more of a, a rust blue, still very high quality, don't get me wrong. But yeah, and of course refurbished guns could have a mix of parts, some original blued, some reblued, depending on what was needed. Some even replacements if the originals were worn out. Speaking of replacements, serial matching on these is interesting. I won't go too deep into it, but I will just say that they used a mix of serial numbers and assembly numbers. So if you have one and think it's not matching, you might double check. Early guns like this would have had mostly a mix of assembly and serial, some parts having one or the other, and the cylinder being the unit that had both to tie everything together. Late production guns, such as this, would have either all serials or the assembly number would have part of the serial plus another unique number mixed in with it. So yeah, just my point is, if you're getting into one of these, just do your research, be careful. But if the numbers don't all appear to match at first, don't, don't fret. And this isn't too uncommon. If you look at, say, Smith & Wesson M&Ps before and during World War II, the uh, 
the serial numbers are on the barrel frame but then you also have assembly numbers on the crane and frame. I wanted to talk about a couple of things and then show you quickly how to disassemble it. One flaw that's often pointed out with these is that the cylinder rotates. It's not locked. It locks when the hammer is pulled. See here it's perfectly locked. It's actually very tight. It won't go the other direction. Well, yeah, it won't. Well, kind of does. It has more of a stop that way, I should say. But this way it spins freely. That seems horrible by modern standard, and it's certainly a shortcoming. But if you go back to the 1890s, many revolvers were like this. Even the original Magant revolvers were, as were some Austrian revolvers and French. So not completely crazy although today we consider it nuts this assembly is pretty cool for these as well so you have three basic steps first if you look back at the trigger guard here you'll see some checkering that's there so you could and this is oily so if I slip guys I apologize I'll get it though that's there so you can press forward on it to hinge your trigger guard. From there, if you look on this side, you'll see a little bit of a patterning here and a little groove for a fingernail. That hinges open. From there, your trigger guard can just be pulled out. So now we have access to the inner lock work for cleaning, oiling, inspection. This was actually a feature taken from the Austrian revolver. And of course we could go further disassembly if we needed to. The grip here, let's see if this one wants to come off. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. I'm not going to force it because these grips get old and ornery. Yeah, this grip is just, oh there we go, held on with a peg. It's not actually held on with screws, it's just pegged in here at the bottom. Now the other grip on this side is actually held in with two short wood screws. I don't, I don't remove those. Don't remove this spring here too. D don't. D don't. Trust me. For further disassembly we need to open this. Fully open it. And then pull this again up and then pull Rever reverse our cylinder. Maybe I'll get this eventually, guys. It kind of just twists off. If you're not stupid like me right now, there we go. Just kind of got to wiggle and twist it off. Here is your cylinder. You're going to want to leave that ejector in there unless you have a reason to take it out. It's not meant to come out for basic cleaning. Here's our frame. And that's field stripping. Most revolvers are kind of boring to take apart, or you need a screwdriver. This is, as you see, pretty, pretty good. Pretty end user friendly. I'll leave that open so you can look at it, guys. Here's our grip. So yeah, the Japanese Type 26. These would definitely not be produced after 1928, although again they would be refurbished and reissued. Many went to China, others went to the Pacific, and of course they were used ex extensively in World War II. And by that point they're getting all quite aged. In total, the Tokyo Arsenal at Koishika would produce somewhere over 59,000 and under 60,000. So a tiny number, guys. Fewer than Type 94s and much fewer than Type 14s. Yet, even though so few were made, and that was a pretty long production run too, remember guys, they reused them and used them, which tells me they held up pretty well in the field. And the Japanese were operating in pretty nasty theaters. Jungles, Pacific Islands, 
the quality of these guns is, is pretty high. The triggers are heavy for being double action only, but they're smooth. The lock breech holds together very securely, but is also smooth. It's a very fine piece of kit, if with some really odd glaring, uh, <laughs> uh, bizarre or just bad design choices. But it was a very common Japanese sidearm in World War II. It wasn't considered standard issue, but it was substitute standard. And to that end, many you find in the U.S. today are heavily pitted, rusted, or just missing parts outright. But yet, many were brought home as, uh, as war trophies because it is an interesting design. Very unique. So I thought we would do another video looking at it now that I had a few more examples to show you here. Like I said, this one, if you look at the serial, is... Uh, pretty late on production, so it has the original finish still. I believe this is around 58,000 serial range. This one is in the 13,000 range, so it was definitely pre-World War I production, which explains why it was refurbished. I really wanted this one just to have these cool grooved grips and a friend uh, traded it to me. Of course, on the other hand, I traded him a 14-inch barrel Bryn II and some other stuff, so it was a very fair trade. Well, hope you enjoyed this, folks. If you did, you might check out the playlist for our other Japanese videos. We have a number of them. And if you could, check out Terry's website. We'll put a link in the description. She's very knowledgeable, has been at this a long time, takes regular trips to Japan. She's not at all your armchair researcher. She has a lot of first-hand experience, speaks Japanese, and has been at it a long time. And is, is Canadian, so you know she's polite. If you have any questions or comments, or would like to share your own Type 26, or heck, any gun, feel free to do so in the comments below there. If you could, like, share, subscribe, and if you like, Click on the link and check out the link to our Patreon page. A dollar goes a long way. If you can, we appreciate it. If you can't, that's great. That's fine, too. Uh, this is Misha. Dual wielding Type 26s. Bet you don't see that in many video games. And we'll catch you very soon next time.